Hi, I'm Mike Shea, author of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master and the author for SlyFlourish.com. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Lazy DM's Workbook. The Lazy DM's Workbook was a companion book to Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master that was funded by the same Kickstarter that funded back in 2018 and has since been published and, and is fully, avail fully available to purchase now. Uh, in today's video, I'm going to talk about this book and I'm going to go through it from top to bottom and show you everything that's in it and all of the different ways you can use this book. Unlike Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy DM's workbook is intended to sit with you while you're actually running your game. It's filled with specific tools, charts, tables, and other things that you can use to help you improvise your game while you're running it, help you drop in things that make your game more interesting, and give you a lot of tools that you can use to uh, when, you, when your game goes left when you thought it was going to go right. Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is intended to give you a framework to help you prepare your game. This book is actually intended to help you run it while you're running it. So uh, let's take a look at it right now. It's a, it's a shorter book. It's about 45 pages or so. Uh, and it was uh, fully designed. So I, I, I did the design of it. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who did the editing on Return, also did the editing on this book. And Scott Fitzgerald Gray and Aaron Get Gray both did development on this book. So they made sure that all of the tables, the things that are in the tables make sense, that the mechanics work, that when you when you actually use it, that it, that it works well. Uh, the beautiful cover art, which you can see uh, uh, below to the right, it was done by Jack Kaiser. It's, I think, I think my favorite piece that he's that he's done. He's done some fantastic artwork, but I really, really love this, this piece. Uh, the art, internal artwork was done by uh, Pedro Patier, and uh, the maps were done by Elvin Tower, Daniel Walthall, and Miska, uh, Miska Friedman, uh, and the page design was done by Eric Nowak and Mark Radel. So we put a lot of energy into this book. Uh, it was the main stretch goal reward for the Return of the, La uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master Kickstarter, and uh, it was going to start out as like a four-panel thing and then turn it into this 45-page book because of all the wonderful support that we got for Return. So uh, there's my little motivational quote from Jeremy Crawford, prep as little as you can. Uh, so I have a one page, like, how do you use this book? How is it intended? I've pretty much described uh, how it's intended, which is you, you, that you sit with it, you keep it, you keep it handy, and you keep it in front of you while you're running your game. Uh, while I believe that the Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is just as good in digital as it is in physical form, you can read it on your phone if you have the uh, EPUB uh, or the Amazon Kindle version. You can read it on PDF on like an iPad. Uh, I think that the Lazy DM workbook, however, really works better with, when it's in print, and that's because it's really handy to have sitting in front of you while you're running your game. Lazy DM, uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, you can sort of read whenever you have an opportunity to read, but this one you want to have like sitting in front of you. So getting a paper copy of this, I think, is even more vital than it would be for, for Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Uh, so to tie it to Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, we have a Lazy DM preparation process uh, single page summary. And if you look at this summary, it has basically all of the main points that came from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Not quite every chapter, but we grabbed the chapters that really had some vital pieces of information to share and that sort of uh, encapsulated the full Lazy DM's process and stuck it in this one this one big page. So it has a Lazy DM checklist, of course, but then also like if you only have five minutes, how would you prepare? What are some of the tools that you need in order to actually run the game? Uh, how to build a lazy campaign, the whole idea of spiral lazy development, uh, spiral campaign development. Uh, some tips for running your game, you know, just some motivational things to, to kind of keep you, keep you, keep your head in the right, in the right place. Uh, what do you do when you just want to think about your game? Uh, what are some of the GM's truths? And then some other lazy DM tricks to just make your game run a little bit faster and a little bit smoother. So that's all here on one page. Uh, we also, so there's there's about four different sections to this book. We'll see when we go through it. Uh, and each one has a description of what you should expect from that section. So we now have a fifth edition reference. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that this book is intended for the fifth edition of D&D. There's probably a lot of stuff that you could do uh, with this book and other RPGs. There's, there's a fair bit of it. I would say probably 70% of it you could use in another RPG. But there's a lot of it that is intended specifically for 5th edition D&D. Uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is useful for pretty much any RPG, uh, but this book in particular was how do you really take those principles and apply it to the 5th edition of Dungeons and & Dragons. And so here we have the 5th edition uh, reference. These, uh, these, these sections that I included in the reference, uh, I got from running polls and surveys during the Kickstarter to try to find out what areas... Uh, most people found really useful to have in front of you during a reference. So I vetoed a couple of them, and then I added a, I, I added a couple that I really like. So it's tailored to things I dig. But uh, a lot of the things that are in here are in here because uh, backers, about the, you know, the, the 6,700 backers, those who responded to the poll said these are the things that are really useful. 
So we have uh, which ability checks, which skills go with the with ability checks. This is something I always forget. And so I like to have it on a, a nice little chart. Uh, a difficulty class, like easy, very easy through nearly impossible, the 5 to 30 on, on your DC. Uh, improvised statistics for traps, obstacles, and other improvised challenges. This is one that a lot of people find very useful. It's level-based, but you can also think about it in, in varying degrees of difficulty. We went through a bunch of different designs on this one. So if you're making an object or you have some kind of uh, hazard or, you know, like a, a giant killer robot statue that you don't want to reskin from a monster, you can use these statistics in order to kind of generate it quickly. It's also very useful for developing traps. If you're if you want to figure out like what is the attack bonus of a spear trap or how much damage should a flaming jet trap do, uh, this gives you a general idea based on both level range and difficulty. So if you are ninth level and you are hit by a, um, you know, some sort of necrotic glyph uh, trap that is supposed to be deadly, uh, it would do 77 damage to the to the to the party, right? That could be pretty pretty brutal. And then you say, okay, well, 77 damage, but make a DC 16 Constitution saving throw for half damage, right? And then that all comes right off of this chart. So very handy chart. Actions in combat. There are a lot of different actions characters can take. Sometimes we forget. This is actually a useful one for DMs to remind our players that, by the way, you can do the help action or the dodge action, you know, things like that. You know, what does dashing do? Uh, all of that is is sitting in here. Uh, cover light and visibility is another one uh, that people ask for. Uh, what what how do you how do you, can you determine what cover does and what happens when you are under particular amounts of cover or can't see what you're looking at? And then uh, one of my favorites is the minimum targets in an area of an effect chart, and uh, this is to help you run theater of the mind combat. So if you have characters that are going down a hallway and uh, a couple of gargoyle statues breathe fire on them, how many? of those characters are going to get hit by the fire breathing statues. And if you say like, well, it's probably like a burning hands. So it's about a 15 foot cone. We can look at our chart and say, okay, that's kind of a small area and therefore two. So probably the first two characters in line are the ones that are going to hit with the flame jets. If it was instead like a fire breathing, you know, dragon statue, and it was a large area, it would instead hit four of the characters. So um, we have some examples of what a, a tiny, small, large, huge, a short line and long line are like based on spell areas. And then it's up to the DM to kind of determine, okay, roughly how big is that? And generally speaking, like a tiny area is like five foot. Uh, a small area is like 10 to 15 feet. Uh, a large area is your, your 20 foot radius or 40 foot square. Huge areas are really big, you know, 40 foot radiuses. Um, you know, 80 foot squares, which pretty much hits everybody that you can see. Uh, short lines are like five foot long and 20 feet, you know, five feet wide and 20 feet long. Long lines are, you know, your 10 foot wide, 60 feet long, like lightning bolts and stuff like that, or five foot line. You know, I think a lightning bolt is five foot wide, but it's like 60 feet long. So, you know, it generally hit like two or three creatures. So this gives you a minimum amount of targets that would likely get hit. And then the DM can, of course, adjudicate, well, you could actually probably hit a couple more or more of you are going to get hit because of the circumstances are all piled up together or something like that. So circumstances still determine it, but this gives you a rough gauge of how many creatures can you generally expect to get hit by uh, a particular area of effect spell. Uh, what breaks concentration? Uh, you know, all the different things that can break concentration. Uh, conditions, this is a big one. Obviously, you know, what do all the conditions do? We wanted to make sure that that was here. Uh, what does exhaustion do is an, another one. So all of those tables, I think, do we have more? Ah, yeah. So, and then we have uh, a couple of new ones that you wouldn't typically find in a DM screen. Uh, one is quick encounter building. Uh, this is based on a lot of work that I did to try to figure out how to quickly build combat encounters. And you see we have some three rules of thumb depending on various, um, I have a kitty right here. Um, three various rules of thumb depending on the level of the characters. And it determines how does a monster's challenge rating compare to the character's level and also the number of monsters compared to the number of characters. So um, I'm not going to go in depth into it here, but essentially you try to figure out, okay, if, and, and the one I like to use is if you have one monster per character, what challenge rating should that monster roughly be to be a hard, right on the edge of deadly fight? Uh, and that's really what we're looking for. Like if it's less than deadly, we kind of don't care. Uh, it'll just, the, the encounter just happens. But if um, you, you want to know if you're throwing things that are too hard at a character. And generally speaking, for characters of second or fourth level, it's about uh, you know, a quarter of a, uh, a challenge rating of one quarter of the character's level is about right. And then above fifth level, it's, that goes up to half. But this chart gives you an idea of how you compare the challenge rating of a monster to the level of a character 
uh, and then how many monsters per character that it, that equates to. Uh, we actually, that's pretty complicated. It's good if you get it in your head, uh, but it's pretty complicated. And we have another table in this book where we go and make it a little bit easier. Uh, the other one is like um, hit points of the average. This is your, I'm, I'm giving you permission to um, change the hit points of monsters depending on the kind of story that is going on and, and, and the pacing of the game. And you can also uh, drop the hit points significantly and make instant minions where one hit knocks them right out. Uh, and then if you want named monsters, really powerful versions, you can give them extra attacks, maximize their hit points, maximize their damage, or do other such things. So these I all consider to be the dials of encounter tuning. When you're running your game, these are a couple of different dials, hit points and damage and things like that, that you can turn to make sure that uh, the challenge is effective uh, to, the, to, the, to the story that you're trying to tell. Uh, then the last area, and this is a tricky one, is uh, running a large number of monsters. If you have many, many monsters attacking the characters, is there a better way than rolling 26 attack rolls to try to figure out who they hit? And this one offers up a table where you can determine, based on the target number you're aiming for, how many uh, creatures succeed in that, uh, in that uh, area. And um, so essentially, if you have a bunch of skeletons, we're going to go with an example. If, if you have 20 skeletons that are attacking a group of four characters, five skeletons are attacking each character, but the characters have an AC of, and the character that's getting hit has an AC of like 17. Skeletons have a plus four, so they need a 13 or better in order to hit, which means for every, and if you look here, 13, 14 is the result on the die that you would need, which means for every three skeletons, one of them hit. So they only get hit by one. Uh, and we, we're going to round it down. So uh, they only get hit by one if um, they're getting attacked by five. Again, a little tricky. Takes a little time to get used to. Um, but but once you kind of get this in your head and you understand how to use it, it means that you can run essentially as many monsters as you want and not have to worry about it slowing down the game. Uh, then there's also a description here about um, uh, there's a description here about pooling hit points. And that's uh, a real handy tool for making sure that uh, when you're running large numbers of monsters, you don't have to track the hit points of a whole bunch of different ones. So uh, uh, worthy tools. One of my favorite tables in all of the fifth edition books are the madness tables. And here we took the short term and long term madness tables and made them a quick reference. And I like these because pretty much any time you have characters who are frightened, you can instead replace this with madness. And uh, it has roughly the same effect depending on, depending on how they roll. But it also has a lot of flavor. A lot of really interesting things can come from the madness table. So I'm a big fan of it because of how thematic it is and because of... Uh, uh, how much it can change the story more so than just something like being frightened. So we put both the short-term and the long-term madness ones in here as a quick reference. Uh, so the next section of the book, that was all sort of the fifth edition reference area. And those are all to help you sort of deal with the mechanics of fifth edition. Uh, the following section are many piles of random tables. And I'm a huge fan of random tables for helping shake you out of uh, uh, shake you out of a groove when you need to be creative. So the intent isn't necessarily that you just purely rely on the random table without any of your own input. It's to help influence you and to help inspire you to come up with really interesting things. So you can roll on a random table and look at it and go, huh. Or you can look at it and go, ah, that's a terrible one. And if it's terrible, roll again, right? Uh, one of the tricks that we did for the random tables in here is we have we stack up multiple tables. And the advantage of that is you get many, many more options than if you have just a single table. So as an example, if you have a 1 to 20 uh, random and table, or random, random and table. If you have a random table of 1 to 20, um, you know, there's only 20 options on there and you're going to run out and you're going to hit duplicates a lot. But if you have two tables that you roll on each of them that are both 1d20, you now have 400 different potential options. And if you add a third, it's up to 8,000. So you can really increase uh, the amount of possible options that occur by stacking multiple tables together, which is exactly what we did here. So we have uh, this, again, a description of it. We have names, traps, monuments, items and town events were sort of the big sections. There's also a uh, random monster one that we'll come to. Uh, so here's a giant page filled with names. There are 300 names on this list, both uh, given names and surnames. And uh, for the surnames, you can, uh, you can change them around. So instead of Star Howler, you can look at it and say Star Bright. You just let your eye sort of flow over the, the surname, the split, the split uh, 
uh, uh, the split trade of the surnames and come up with your own. So this actually has way more than just the ones that are on here. But right here, there's about 300 given names and about 200 surnames right on this list. And you can just grab whatever you want. And there's enough of them here that even if you start to duplicate them, you're probably not going to remember the fact that you had, you know, Luke, Lucan twice because by the time you have you be using Lucan again, it'll be five years from now. So we really feel like this is enough names to last you a good long time. Uh, random traps. Here's an example of where you can have three different um, three different tables to, together. And I actually like to use it in five different tables, which gives some, I don't know, it's like a half a million options or something like that, 20, 20 to the fifth power. So um, you can uh, uh, essentially you say, okay, well, what kind of trap is it? I, I actually like to roll on the middle table and then the left table first. So as an example with this, we'll say we have a, uh, what was that though? I should roll in front of me. Uh, that was a 20, a confusing uh, 14, confusing whips, right? So weird whips that hit you when you hit them, they, you, you are confused by it. And if you want to have a simple trap, you have confusing whips that are triggered by a uh, child's toy. So there might be like a child's toy lying in a hallway. And when you pick it up, all of a sudden these whips start whipping you. Uh, if you want to just have a simple trap, just roll on the first table, right? And you say, oh, I just need to, I need a quick trap, uh, nine. So we have poison darts. You know, or just darts, right? You know, darts shoot out of the walls. Okay. Uh, you know, you might say, I need another trap. We have 12 axes, right? Swinging axes come at you. But if you want to add some co cool flavor to them, then you add the second table in first. So you say, like, we're going to have 12 is uh, deafening uh, and 17, deafening cages, right? So these huge cages come down, only you can't hear the people that are inside them and they can't hear outside of them. Like, that's a weird, that's a weird magical trap, isn't it? Now, if you want to be really devastating, you can, I'm going to put this thing down so I damage my table. Um, you can roll twice and come up with two different thematic traps. So we're going to have a really devastating one that's, uh, let's see, 18, psychic tendrils and uh, blinding bolts. So psychic tendrils and blinding bolts uh, triggered by a golden angelic statue, right? That is a pretty powerful, like, cinematic you know set piece trap right where you know weird what did i say they were i don't remember dominating tendrils psychic tendrils are weaving around the room and at the meantime these bolts are, are slamming in you know so you can do some really interesting stuff and then we grab the damage severity by level this was this 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 is an abbreviated version of the chart that we had previously so you can figure out what are the dcs what are the attack bonuses and how much damage these traps should do so on this one page you have nearly not quite infinite but you have Many, many, many traps that you can quickly develop on the fly to kind of fill up anything. So if you're ever reading an adventure, I had this recently. If you're reading an adventure and you um, realize that uh, the traps in there are kind of boring, you can use a table like this and come up with some really wild and interesting ones. Uh, likewise, we have a monument section. If you ever need to have an object that is inside of a room that is interesting, we have a whole series. We have three D20 tables and then a D100 table to generate interesting monuments. Uh, we start with an origin. So we'll, we'll, as an example, we have a draconic, um, gore-covered, uh, poisonous, uh, and then we roll a D100 here, 99. Um, we have a draconic, gore-covered, poisonous idol, right? So immediately you have like, wow, what is that, right? A draconic poison, and maybe it's this green dragon statue, right? That's lurking there and its mouth is open and poisonous gas is flowing out, you know, and it's kind of filling up the room. Like that's an interesting set piece, right? You go, what the hell is that? Right. And then like you can tie a secret and clue to it. Who was that dragon? Where did this idol come from? Who said it here? Is the cult of the dragon nearby? What is going on? Right. So you can you can really take something like this. Just roll a few dice and come up with a whole story element and a whole interesting thing for the characters to deal with. I'm a huge fan of random monuments. Uh, another one is random items. Uh, so we I, I've called these relics before as well. And we have this is a two table, uh, a two table set. And like the monument, uh, you kind of roll to determine where did it come from? We have a six, that's an unholy, and its condition is an, a smooth unholy. And in this case, you can either roll like a weapon, like a smooth unholy, uh, that was a 16, uh, a smooth unholy scimitar, right? That's kind of weird. Uh, there's black onyx scimitar, right? That has no markings on it whatsoever. Uh, or if you want to have a, a different item, something that they find along the way, you roll a D100 instead of the, the weapon. And we have a 98 this time. And it's a smooth, unholy vial, right? There's a vial and it's 
you can feel the necrotic energy coming off. What the hell's in that vial, right? Ooh, that's weird. Um, so with these tables, you can create an item. And sometimes you might just want an item. And you're like, I don't need all that. Where did it come from? And what is its condition stuff? I'm just going to roll, did I roll 94 this time, uh, a tiara, right? So if you need a quick item, you have a tiara. If you want to say like, well, who, where that tiara come from? What makes that tiara interesting? You roll on, you roll 13. It's a vampiric tiara. <laughs> now we're interested, right? And then if you want to make it magical, and, and there's, there's a couple different uh, interesting things you can do here. Um, we have a whole list of magical effects. So with that vampiric tiara, an 83, cast banishment. It is an un, uh, vampiric tiara that can cast banishment once, right? So uh, I really like to create interesting items that have a single use of a powerful spell. Uh, by the way, the spell list here goes from low level to high level. It goes from a first level light spell. They all at least first level, but they go from a low level light spell to a high level disintegrate, a sixth level disintegrate spell. And I like to, you, you, can, you can roll on this, but the other thing you can do is determine what level your characters are and then choose a spell that's slightly higher or even majorly higher than they are. So giving like a third level character a single use of disintegrate, like they're going to hang on to that and they're going to know they have it and it's really good and they're going to use it once. And the nice thing is it's not game breaking because they're only going to do it once. So maybe they do it on your boss and maybe your boss gets disintegrated, right? That's cool, but then it's over, right? Like they, they've used the item and still what kind of cool story is it that they've been hunting this boss forever and they walk into the room and the boss gives his whole big line about how he's going to kill them and rule the world and bang, you hit him with disintegrate and he's gone. And you're like, holy cow. And all his guards are like, whoa. You know, that's a fun story and we want to, we want to implement stories like that. So the random items are a great way. If you want to just throw in an actual magical item, uh, like a magic weapon, we have a weapon table, we have an armor table. Uh, if you just want to drop in healing potions, we have a little quick healing potion thing. Uh, and then if you want to drop in single use items, uh, that works too. I also like tying the spell effects as an, instead of a single use as a, a once per day. So essentially uh, you use the spell that's on it and then it recovers at the next on. You can either do that on an item, but you can also do it on a weapon. So you could, for example, have a, a magical dagger that does uh, 22, uh, that casts silence, right? Once per day, this dagger can silence people or cast silence in an area. Powerful magic item, really interesting and unique. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, goes, goes beyond the typical treasure tables that you'll, that you'll see. Uh, so we also have random town events, right? And this is when you, people are going to town, what's going on in the town? What is the weather like? What is the sentiment of the town like? Uh, is there any mundane events happening or are there any fantastic events happening? And I really enjoy sort of rolling, you know, rolling various tables. We'll do a quick one here. So you, uh, you approach the town of, uh, what do we, what do we have? Let's pick a. Let's go to a random name table here, right? So, uh, the town of uh, Gloomfang. That's a terrible town. No one wants to go to Gloomfang. But you have to go to Gloomfang, right? Your, uh, your NPC is there. Uh, when you go to Gloomfang, it is eight. There's a moderate rain falling. The sentiment of the town is harried. They have been harried in this moderate rainstorm. Uh, there is a mundane event going on when you get there, uh, which is a robbery has just taken place. Right, so now we got like a cool story, but let's see, now we'll go crazy with the fantastic events. And the fast and fantastic events are six. A second sun has appeared in the sky. So maybe when this rain is falling, they look and they're like, why are there two orbs in the sky, right? That's some craziness. So now you have like, wow, we built a town in like four rolls, right? And it's got interesting stories all taking place. So this whole, all these tables are kind of full of, of, of ways to do that. So uh, the last random table we have in here, and it has sort of its own section to describe how to use it, is the random dungeon monster table. Um, and in this table, we are, uh, it, it's reminiscent of the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide table to dungeon levels. So you'll see other books that have lots of uh, random encounters by environment type. Uh, this one, we wanted to have it be like a, you know, like, like the old school dungeon delving. So the way this works is that you roll, um, uh, you roll a, you, so you decide how deep your dungeon is. And the deeper it is, the more dangerous it is. So you can think of the dungeon level as roughly equivalent to character level, but not, it shouldn't be so specific. If the characters are level three and they go down to dungeon level seven, they are facing what's down on dungeon level seven. Uh, and so once you figure out what dungeon level they are on, you then roll a d20 die. You, you start by going up and down on the dungeon level one. You say, okay, we're on dungeon level seven. So now you roll a d20 
and we rolled a 10. That's going to be pretty high. And you follow along to the right, and you see 6 to 10, which means it's monster table 4. So then you go to monster table 4. We have 1, 2, 3, 4. And then you roll a d20 on monster table 4. And we rolled a 3, which means there are Gricks. Right? Now, Gricks are challenge rating 2 or 3. We then say, okay, like, well, how many monsters should be there? And that's when we go back up here and we use our thing. So if they were third level characters, um, we know that they're in the second or fourth. And we know that Gricks, I think, are CR2. Um, we know that a one Grick is roughly equivalent to um, really one per, well, not quite. It's about one per every two characters. So if there are four characters going down there, two Gricks is about right. If you really want to ramp it up, three Gricks are what they fight, especially when they went down to dungeon level seven like a bunch of chumps, when they know that they shouldn't be going down to dungeon level seven. So fighting three Gricks would be pretty hard for a bunch of third level characters. But we very quickly built an encounter. Then of course you can go back and you say, hey, you go into the room with the draconic statue, the crazy poison draconic statue, and as you approach it, three Gricks come and attack from the side. We have a whole encounter, really interesting stuff, and it all uh, happened with just a few rolls in this table. So this table really gives you a whole lot. And you can just you can skip the whole monster table by dungeon level and just have some random monsters at any given challenge rating. So, you know, if you want to go down and we, we we labeled which challenge rating you have. So if you have a five to eight, you know, which which monsters are uh, and you know, do you want for a, a five to eight challenge? You have seven driders. We're gonna have driders attack, right? So uh, good way. And of course you can roll on multi the table multiple times, you can kind of mix and match, but uh, they're all here in this thing. So uh, then I mentioned before that the encounter building tips, which we had up here, uh, were a little difficult to kind of figure out because it's that whole ratio. So instead, we have a big table. And um, this is the whole one-page guide to... Um, so there's a whole one-page guide for building 5e encounters. And um, we have our tips, which is, you know, choose, start with the story. What monsters make sense given the story that's taking place? Uh, you can, of course, tune battles by increasing or decreasing hit points or the number of monsters. Uh, there are many different things that affect a, a uh, how difficult a battle is going to be. So, uh, and be very careful with first level characters because they're very squishy. Uh, and your experience as a GM is going to overtake uh, any kind of chart that you're going to use. So that said, you can figure out if your characters are third level, we'll go with our third level ones. Um, then we say, like, how many monsters uh, do we want? Per character, we we can look across the side and realize for if there's two monsters per character, they can be should probably not be any higher than challenge rating one fourth. If we have one monster per character, it's challenge rating one. If we have one monster for every two characters, it's challenge rating two. And if it's one monster for four characters, it's challenge rating four. Keep in mind that if you have one monster for four for four characters, they're going to beat the crap out of that monster. So going even higher than this is not terrible. Uh, and this chart goes up as you go. So 13th level, you know, how many characters? You can even have four monsters, four challenge rating one monsters per character uh, is, is a reasonable challenge. So this is all based on the idea that it's quote unquote a, a, a hard on the edge of deadly. So if you go higher than this chart, you're heading into deadly territory. If you go lower in this chart, the battle's definitely easier, sort of an easy way. So a chart like this makes it a lot easier to quickly develop uh, a combat encounter on the fly. Uh, so now I have a two page guide. This is a this is one that I've spent again a lot of time thinking about. Probably the two areas where I've spent the most time thinking about D and D design is one encounter building the table that you saw before, and two on how to run theater of the mind combat for fifth edition. And I have a two page guide here that goes over all of the things that can help you run combat in theater of the mind. It is a guide both for players and for dungeon masters. Uh, it's intended to give principles that help players and GMs. Uh, effectively engage in combat without needing uh, a map or miniatures. And it, probably the number one thing is that the characters describe their, in, the players describe their intent. The GM describes what's going on every, every turn. The player describes what they want to do and what they intend to do. And then the GM adjudicates how that works out. Leaning towards the character. You want, you know, the characters are the heroes. We lean towards, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we round towards the heroes when it comes to like, could that work or not? We say, yeah, it sounds cool. And we go with cool. So um, not a lot of deep mechanics in here, but a lot of ways of like, well, what do you do when X is true? How do you have your glaive wielding sentinel fighter 
You're like, how do you do that in theater of the mind? And the answer is, what do you want it to do? I'm a glaive wielding sentinel fighter. I want to be standing between my friends and the enemies, but I'm staying five feet back so that I can poke them with my glaive as they're coming in. I'm a pole arm master sentinel fighter. Okay, great. So you're charging in, you're not engaging them directly, but you are getting in between them and your friends. Yes, okay, good. Now I know, whenever the monsters are trying to get past you, you're getting hits with your glaive. So it's about describing intent. And even the most complicated, uh, futzy mechanics that a character has, if they, if the, if the player can describe what they're trying to do, we can usually figure it out in theater of the mind. So that's a big one. Two page guide that talks about all sorts of things. Again, we sort of reiterate the, how do areas of effect work? Uh, we offer some, some things like uh, randomly selected targets, features and environment and terrain, uh, identifying monsters by physical traits and going big with descriptions. All of these are intended to help a GM run great theater of the mind, um, uh, uh theater of the mind guides. Um, we have a section here on, create, on connecting characters. This is a big one for campaign building. And uh, it's just a quick one page guide that says, uh, one way that you can connect characters is everybody chooses like how they're connected to other characters at the table. And it can be like they're an apprentice of so-and-so or they idolize so-and-so or they're indebted to so-and-so. And it's a way to create a bond between two characters that helps the group stay cohesive. But another way to do it is that all of the characters are tied to one big background. And they could all, for example, be part of a thieves guild, a secret society, a spy network. They could all be part of the constabulatory. They could be magically bound together. Uh, they could be like, you know, seekers of vengeance. It's the idea is to have like one shared background that binds the characters together. So this is a, a quick way to uh, uh, do that if you're running a new campaign. So that is, the, that, that is about half the book at this point. The other half, which I'm not going to go through in nearly as much depth, are the lazy layers. Uh, what we intended for this section of the book is that when you're running your game, sometimes the characters go in a direction you didn't expect. And you wanna have a quote unquote dungeon ready so that if they go into a place, you can quickly pull that place up. So what we did is design 10 different locations that are uh, as, as universal as we could think of. So what are the 10 most common types of layers that characters get involved in? I like to joke that these are Sly Flourish's mundane locations as opposed to Sly Flourish's fantastic locations. Um, that these are places that are common. So we have a castle, docks, sewers, catacombs, caves, cellars, a dungeon, mines, a temple, and a wizard's tower. Um, those, when we thought about all the different kinds of dungeons that are most common, those 10 seem to come up the most often. So for each of these, instead of, we, we don't describe what's in them from like a, from, from, a, from an NPC or a monster standpoint. It's up to you to bring the NPCs and monsters and your own story that wraps on top of this. But we give the locations. So we do have quick descriptions. We have area aspects, just so you have a quick description of like what's in any, any given place. And then like a one line or two line bit of flavor text that you can read aloud right to your players. They are context independent, which means you can read these passage, you can read these read aloud text areas and not worry about giving something up uh, because they don't include monsters, they don't include stories, they don't include other things. So uh, we have the castle here. Uh, the castle is a big one, 28 rooms, two levels, big castle with lots of things going on. So if you need a castle, here, here you go. You have a nice castle. And we did put interesting things. Large ballista, a big uh, pit with a, with a uh, cage that goes down deep beneath the castle. Uh, we have a huge dragon skull. I love this dragon skull because like, how the hell did it get in there? There's no room for that dragon skull to get in there. Also, this big dragon rib cage that sits below. So interesting things that, that exist and little secret areas, right? Like secret tunnels that can get you outside of the, of the castle. Uh, we have the docks. Uh, anytime you need a dock, we have a dock with a warehouse and storage areas and ships and a little smuggler's cove and all kinds of things. So one interesting thing you can do is you can sort of you can you can crop these out. So if you say like, all I need is a smuggler cove, well, you skip the dock area and you just stick to areas seven, eight, and, seven, eight, and nine, right? If you just need the dock, you don't want a smuggler cove, you just ignore this little secret area and you ignore seven, eight, and nine. So you can actually take a couple of these and sort of split them out and just choose the pieces that you want. Uh, so we have docks, we have a two layer sewer system. Great big sewer system. If you think about the sewers, I, I don't know if I thought, I think I was thinking about the movie It. Uh, it had come out when I did this and they have a great sewer system in it. So again, a two layer sewer system. You don't necessarily need to have two layers, but if you want them, you have them. It includes a little hags den. So if you want to put a little hag in here, you can do that too. Um, so, you know, nice general sewer system that you could drop underneath anything. You can also extend this way out. So even though it's kind of packed on this map, you know, this area between 11 and 12 might be 400 feet rather than, rather than 15 feet. Um, catacombs, 
right? Where do you keep the dead? I've used this one personally a lot. I used it for a Shadow of the Demon Lord game recently. I think I used it twice. I split it into two different areas. So again, you can sort of have, you know, area 9, 10, 11, and 12 be one dungeon and one through eight can be another. You know, you can cut out rooms or you can add rooms or you could run just one of the rooms. Uh, the intent is to make them as modular as possible. Uh, we have a whole cave system, you know, and, and if you notice the cave and the sewers kind of connect through seven and the cave and the castle connect through 11. So one of the little dirty tricks here that isn't really described in the book is all of these maps can connect together. So you can actually build one Uber location that's got every one of the 10 maps all interconnected with one another. I thought that was kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, we have cellars, you know, anywhere sitting underneath any set of cellars. They are obviously big. This also has like a cave system with like secret, uh, you know, here's again the connection to the sewer. Um, and a uh, secret connection to like a, a little cult's cave system or a uh, thieves' den. You know, number five is sort of a thieves' den. All kinds of interesting stuff. But if you just want a cellar, you can use areas one, two, and three and skip all these like secret entrances into the other stuff. You choose what you want. Uh, a, a gen general dungeon, and by dungeon we mean an actual place where they're keeping prisoners. So here they have like a gladiatorial arena and a judging area and a, you know, some terrible cells and a huge cell for big monsters and stuff like that. And again, we have passageways that lead up into other areas such as the castle. Uh, we have a mine, a dwarven mine. Uh, you know, and this old dwarven mine, like a huge skull that's sticking out of the ground, a great pits that lead down deep into deep shafts. Uh, so all kinds of stuff that you can do here uh, with, with the mine. Uh, we have a temple. The temple can be either overland or underground. It's we, we, we tried to make it so that you could choose where the temple existed. Uh, again, I've used this myself in, in a few different games. It's real handy to have. Uh, you can cut out areas you don't want. If you just want to start right with four and go right into the temple complex, you can. If you just want like a little mausoleum area, you have area three. Um, but you know, the, the, the intent is that you can cut it up in any way you want. And finally, we have a wizard's tower. Uh, this is a five level sorry, four level tower with a secret little a secret little dimensional rift area. Um, and the intent here is that you can make it, we didn't choose whether the wizard's tower was uh, circular or square, or even if it's a wizard, if it's an actual tower, it's like, it's four levels, one on top of the other, but it, you can kind of make it whatever you want. So maybe it's a drow wizard that's embedded in an, inside of a giant stalagmite and it actually goes down instead of up, you know, whatever you want to do. The last section of the book includes a bunch of fill-in pages. Uh, these are based on the principles of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, and you can use them to sort of track anything you want. So we have a session worksheet. Uh, this goes through the whole eight steps from Return. You can kind of just fill it out if you want. Uh, we have a character tracker, really handy to have in front of you to remember the characters, their backgrounds, traits, other notes, anything else that you need. Uh, uh, an NPC tracker, I have a real problem memorizing and figuring, remembering NPCs. Uh, and a campaign planner. If you want to sit down at the beginning of your campaign and think about what you want to do, you start with your hook. What is the point of this campaign? What are the six truths that exist in this world? Uh, and what are the main fronts? What are the main uh, uh, enemies or things that are pushing forward? So uh, that is the book. Uh, I have now gone through the entire book. That took longer than I expected, uh, 40 minutes. But uh, you have seen everything that is in here. Uh, I hope you found this video useful. I hope you like this book. Uh, this was a real labor of love. We really loved uh, doing it. And uh, I think it can be very useful. It has, it has helped my game, certainly. And uh, I hope that it can help uh, your game as well. So thank you very much for watching and uh, keep playing some D&D.